And welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Chase in 28 podcast here on Pinstripe Prospects, episode number eight. So we got Chase in 28, episode eight. Always a nice way to end with the same number. I'm your host, Ricky Keeler, managing editor here at Pinstripe Prospects. Happy to be back with you once again this week. We actually have Yankee news and signings to talk about. DJ LeMahieu is back. The long Yankee nightmare is over. We'll dive into his contract, and we'll dive into the contract of Corey Kluber, getting a one-year deal to join the Yankees' rotation. Of course, for every Yankee sign, there's a what-if, because another pitcher went to the Padres this week. Uh, So we'll talk about that. George Springer going to the Blue Jays uh, as well. In our minor league segment in the second half of the show, we'll talk about three Yankees in the Baseball America Top 100 prospects list. We'll talk about our minor league position overview of the week. Looking at first base, and of course, uh, there are serious news in baseball this week, so we will touch a little bit on uh, the Jared Porter situation uh, with the Mets, a story that has to get uh, talked about, just a crazy story going on uh, with Jared Porter. want to remind you, you can tweet us at Pinstripe Pros on Twitter, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Again, just search for Pinstripe Prospects right now. We're working on getting it being Chase in 28, but that's where you find it. Any On any of the places you get your podcasts, just search Pinstripe Prospects. Please give us a rating. We want to hear from you. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. And please give us, give us that rating. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you want to hear in 2021. And we will tell you more about the Dugout Membership Program a little bit later on in the show. So I want to bring in my panel for the evening. And, of course, we always start with the person who does a good job running our social media. Alexis Farinacci is here. Alexis, how are you? Doing well. Good to be back, guys. Uh, good to have DJ LeMayhew back in our corner. Um, so exciting time for us there. Uh, looking forward to talking about all about it tonight. And since, unfortunately, James O'Connell is not with us this week, we have the Pinstripe Prospects resident sabermetrician, uh, Robert Coles is back. Robert, how are you? I'm doing great. Uh, always fun to to get the chance to hop on with you guys. I'm, I always look for. I, I look. I can't wait to see what what great stat Robert brings on the show this week. I, I find I learn something every time, so I think you guys will learn too. But I don't know where it is. That's what makes this fun. So let's start with DJ Lemayhew again. Six years, ninety million dollars. None of these deals are official. Official yet which we'll get into later what that could mean. Uh, but Alexis, since you and I have talked in this podcast for, I don't know, the last like two months on this with our weekly DJ LeMayhew rumor of the week, just the fact that I think to me, when I first saw this resigning, I was like, phew, we can finally stop talking about LeMayhew rumors every week. Yeah, uh, definitely a relief. I think all Yankees fans were kind of breathe that sigh of like, finally Yankees, what took you so long? DJ, what took you so long? But, uh, little bit of a breath of fresh air there and then you know that, that was just a good day for Yankees fans because then you get Corey Kluber just uh, hours after um not a bad day for Yankees fans at all uh welcome back DJ for sure yeah that was Brian Cashman saying look we've done nothing for two months I gave you one day and now you people want me to do more uh, I don't know we'll get into that a little bit later too uh, Robert, what'd you think of uh, LeMahieu coming back and are you we'll get into this now lead him with this are you surprised it was six years yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm of course happy that that DJ is back. It was something that I expected uh, to to happen eventually. Um, on the six years front, uh, I mean, I think it's great for. I mean, I guess both DJ and the Yankees. I don't think I don't know if I was expecting the six year deal. Um, I thought they would have landed on some number, maybe in the five year range. Um, but yeah, I mean, the six year it, it helps the Yankees with the luxury tax threshold. Um, and, you know, it helps DJ. It gives DJ the opportunity to have, you know, one more year, uh, you know, of a contract. Um, and, you know, towards, you know, probably wants to retire a Yankee. And, you know, the six-year deal does that for him. So, you know, DJ gets more security. And, you know, the Yankees kind of get their guy without having to, you know, pay too much in taxes, which, you know, is always nice. Yeah, I thought I, I thought to myself, Alexis, on this one, I was shocked at first when I saw six years. But at the same time, I think about it. And, of course, you have the luxury tax implications for the Yankees. But a contact hitter really doesn't lose much in a six-year deal. Like, I've always talked about the worry that he would be a a Ben Zobrist at age 38. But if he's still hitting at a good contact clip, his skills aren't going to deteriorate that much from what he is. Maybe he just won't hit a lot of home runs, but the Yankees don't really need him to hit a lot of home runs. And if he's still versatile, he'll still have value toward the latter stages of that contract. And even if he doesn't, 
You're only paying him 15 mil a year. That's I know we're saying only 15 million. It's crazy, but it's a contract that is not a burden on your uh, accounting books if you're the Yankees. Yeah, for sure. Definitely a, a good contract and one that the Yankees and DJ both have flexibility with. No, no taxes as Rob was saying. Um, you know, DJ, not only can he hit uh, home runs, but he's a great line drive guy. He's a guy who can get on base and drive in runs. And that's what we need the Yankees to do right now. And, you know, DJ said he wants to be a Yankee. And with that six years, as Rob said, you know, he can retire as one. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll have him longer. Who knows? Six years be a while. But, uh, yeah, just overall really good re-sign for the Yankees. And I think it, it, a little bit of excitement for that clubhouse as well. You know, all the players really wanted him back. So I'll, I'll throw this to you as well, Alexis. Do both sides end up winning on this deal? Because LeMahieu reportedly turned down four years, $78 million to join the Blue Jays. LeMahieu wanted to be here. In the end, is this a win-win after the whole crazy negotiation period where it seemed both sides are ticked at each other for not wanting to do this earlier than mid-January? Oh, yeah. I definitely think win for both sides on this one, for sure. Uh, DJ got a good six-year contract. He wanted long-term. You know, that's what he said. He's like, I want long-term. Uh, you know, I don't know that money was always an option for him, but he wanted that security blanket, and I think he gets that with the Yankees, and the Yankees get their guy back, and more importantly than just being their guy, you know, he was the most talked about and one of the hottest uh, – top free agents uh, that were out there this year to go get. And, man, the Blue Jays did their job this offseason. The Blue Jays have done a phenomenal job in their signings. And, uh, you know, the fact that DJ turned that down, uh, I think, says something about the Yankees and says something to Brian Cashman and his loyalty to the organization. Yeah, Toronto's been a close second on a lot of players, Robert. I know they just got George Springer, and and I think that's going to help their outfield in a big way, even though they ended up not getting Michael Brantley. Uh, but to keep LeMahieu out of Toronto, I think, is, is the biggest deal for the Yankees in this, just because, yes, you would have to figure out where he would LeMahieu would play in that crowded infield that Toronto has, but you'd rather avoid that problem and just keep him here. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I definitely think um, that that might have played a role. I, I don't know uh, if they would have signed Springer had they also signed LeMahieu. I don't, I don't really know how that works. But just kind of going back to, you know, if this is a win for both sides, um, I mean, I definitely, I definitely think it is because when you get a guy that DJ's probably been worth in terms of his performance, thirty million dollars a year each of the past two years, and now you're getting him, you know, for a fifteen million dollar um, AAV, and and you know, you have to assume he's not going to be, you know, half as bad as as what he's been the past two years, um, and you know, DJ got the long term contract that he wanted. Um, and I think, you know, defending him from going to the Blue Jays was big. I think that would have felt very weird. Um, but, I mean, it felt like the whole time that the Yankees and DJ had a mutual understanding that they wanted to get this done. Um, and, and it just kind of took a little bit to get there. But uh, but here we are. And getting LeMay, who had only $15 million, allows the Yankees to go after Corey Kluber. Jeff Passan reported last Friday uh, that Corey Kluber signed with the Yankees one year, $11 million. Again, another deal, not official official, but on the books as it is. Uh, Alexis, you wrote the story for us here at Pinchai Prospects on the Kluber signing. Uh, what kind of impact do you think he can have on the rotation, and was it worth uh, the risk to bring him in? Uh, I think he can have a, a real positive impact. I mean, if he can come back healthy, you know, they were saying in his workout that he had down here in Florida uh, that it was it was nothing but positives. He was back to the velocity he was at pre-injury, uh, shining that fla- that fastball like he has been in the past and seasons past, and I think that's something that the Yankees can be excited about. Uh, you know, and it's going to be excuse me something that our rotation needs. Uh, if we can, if he can be successful and get swings and misses like we need, um, then yeah, I think it's going to be a big impact to that to that starting rotation. Just really compliment uh, Garrett Cole in there as well. Robert, I think when you look at the Kluber situation, to me, it just seems like it's a deal that when you look at it, they want him in October. They need his big game pitching in October. Yes, it's a what if, but I feel like in this off season of COVID, where teams, I don't, we don't, we're not hearing that much about the free agent meeting process. And one of the things I've noticed this off season, when you look at all the deals that most of the deals that have been made so far, a lot of free agents are going to places where they're familiar with, and this is where having Eric Cressy as the guy who runs your uh, strength and conditioning programs, where having Matt Blake as your pitching coach used to work with Kluber in Cleveland, 
ultimately, I think Kluber chose the team, and he probably had a lot of suitors, and maybe somebody could have offered him more than $11 million, but it sounds like Kluber joined the place that he would be most comfortable with, and he's familiar with a lot of those uh, faces in the Yankees organization. Yeah, definitely. And you have to think, I I think a plus uh, for the Yankees, at least, is that last season, they kind of didn't really have any COVID issues, at least during the season itself. Uh, and I think, you know, for some players, maybe even Kluber, that that's kind of a sign of discipline and, and being able to go about, you know, doing your job on a on a day to day basis and not getting distracted. Uh, and then you mentioned the, the familiarity that Kluber has, you know, with Matt Blake from Cleveland um, and, you know, Pressy, where they held the workout. Um, I think, yeah, familiarity in, in, you know, uncertain times is definitely a plus. And I think we know that Kluber uh, took a bit of a pay cut to come to the Yankees. Um, I, I think, I, I think, you know, he definitely had suitors out there that were probably willing to give him uh, more money, but, you know, he saw an opportunity with the Yankees to kind of, um, you know, turn his career around and, and you know, end it on a high note. Um, so I think, you know, yeah, I agree with you. I think he, he kind of sought out the Yankees to some degree. So I threw this hypothetical out on Twitter on Tuesday night when I saw the Jose Quintana $8 million deal to go to the Angels and re- and now Quintana's reunited with Joe Madden. And this is before Jay Happ signed an $8 million deal with the Minnesota Twins for one year. So I would not take Jay Happ back at $8 million. The Yankee fans, I'm sure, are thrilled that Jay Happ's in Minnesota. But looking at these three pitchers, and with the Yankees, what however you want to agree with it or not, they're trying to stand on the competitive balance tax. You can complain about all you want. That's the way it is, I think. So, Robert, I threw this hypothetical out there. Would you rather have Kluber at $11 million, Quintana at $8 million, or if you wanted to save a little more money for your competitive balance tax, I don't think it would make that much sense for the Yankees, but it's a familiar name, John Lester going to Washington for $5 million, which I thought was a steal for the Nationals. Uh, what, who would you take in the, out of those three hypotheticals, Kluber at eleven, Quintana at 8 or Lester at 5 Yeah, I mean, I think assuming... And I think you have to assume full health for a guy. Um, I, I think the I think the answer there is Kluber at eleven million because if he stays healthy, I mean, you're getting a pitcher that uh, has that playoff experience, has maybe the best curveball uh, in baseball, and is someone that you can slot, you know, behind Cole and Severino when it comes to October. Um, with Quintana and Lester, a little more unpredictable. Um, I don't think either of them are as good as Kluber. You know, when they're all at uh, you know, peak health or, you know, and somewhat, you know, good standing health wise. Um, so I think, you know, even when you look beyond that, you know, you have Marcus Stroman, 18 million, you have Kevin Gaussman, 18 million. I think Kluber is closer to that 18 million number um, than he is, than he is like the, the 8 million number that Quintana has. Uh, so I, so I actually think the Yankees um, got, got Kluber at a good price here, to be honest. Yeah, I'd agree with that, but and Alexis, I'll have you answer the same hypothetical, but also with the injuries Kluber's had, and I know they've been a lot of different types of injuries, they're not really the same injury, but it just, when you have a Yankee team array that's had so many injuries over the last two years, to ask now to rely on another player to avoid injury, which any player needs to avoid injury for a team to be successful, but to have a guy that you're going to rely on that much, at least early in the season, to pitch like the guy he was in Cleveland... I mean that's a big ask at eleven million dollars, albeit it's it's a it's a not a horrible contract, but you felt like you could have pieced maybe two starters together. Maybe the Yankees will still do that, uh, but what did you make of it? And are the injuries concerning on the Kluber front? I think any player you get that has a history of injuries, yeah, you're you've got some concern going into it, and you've got the question marks of how long can this, this guy stay healthy. Um, but the same token, you know, I'm I'm kind of impressed and you know holding on to some positivity with how that mound appearance went for him and that bullpen session went for him that all the scouts were at. Um, and you know, I, I like Eric Cressy. Um, I gotta say, I, I know many athletes who've worked with him, um, just even in the CrossFit realm. So I think knowing that he's under his wing for rehab too, and I think I think we're gonna have a good season out of Kluber. So does this mean in your mind that Masio Tanaka is officially gone? I don't know. You know, many of the posts that Tanaka has been posting with all the Yankees jackets and everything like that, I mean, you have to wonder if he's staying. I mean, I know there's that question mark in the Yankees' minds of clearing room on the 40-man uh, roster and opening up cap space um, in the budget, but I don't know. 
Robert, what do you think? Is is there a Tanaka? Yeah, I know Michael K. I think I heard a couple of days ago saying he wants fifteen to eighteen million for one year, so that Stroman, uh, Gossman money. But I don't think a team is going to give that to him if the Yankees aren't even willing to give that to him. Yeah, I don't know that. Um, I don't know if I see that happening just because I don't think the Yankees uh, really are in the business of giving another mid-level starter, uh, you know, anywhere in the range from. 13 to 18 million dollars as you mentioned i think they're better off trying to find another relief arm uh, someone that they can use in the playoffs because you know at the end of the day tanaka is a fine pitcher um, but he's not someone that you need to overspend on or you know break the bank for and you know that's what they would probably have to end up doing if they wanted to bring him back um so you know i I don't see the reunion happening it's obviously sad um you know tanaka has been such a, a fun part of you know the yankees past nine years or however long it's been. Um, but yeah, I don't see it happening. I see them going maybe after a couple more relief arms and, and trying to bolster their bullpen for, you know, an eventual playoff run. And we know even though it's January 20th as we record this, Brian Cashman's never done making moves, even though we're less than a month away from spring training as of right now, as crazy as that is. But the Yankees still have to clear two 40-man roster spots to make these moves officially. Uh, Robert, do you have any idea what those moves might make? Any crazy predictions you think might happen? Or is it just strictly the Yankees are going to DFA a couple of guys and make some small trades? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, per- perusing t- Twitter today, um, or, or even in the last week, you would see names thrown out there like Luis Castillo, um, even even some Trevor Rosenthal, uh, some Tre- Trevor Rosenthal tweets out there. Um, like a guy like Trevor Rosenthal would be great. You know, he's a big name obviously and and and, you know he's he's got the ability to be a very good piece of a championship caliber bullpen um but knowing kind of how the yankees do their thing sometimes i they they'll have the opportunity to make changes throughout the season um and i you know even though last year they didn't really do much at the deadline um you know I, i think we'll see them kind of go into the season with what they have because you know they have the ability now to uh, kind of get through an injury riddled April, May, June. Um, and then when it comes to the trade deadline, be able to add the necessary pieces, be able to look at your team and where they stand and then decide, okay, here's where we need to go. And, you know, maybe spend a little bit more money or, you know, trade, you know, some, some better assets that we have uh, and go from there. So I, I'd be surprised if another big splash was coming before the season started. Uh, obviously anything is possible, but I think they'll wait. Uh, they'll wait until, you know, July comes rolling around in the middle of the season. And I think Alexis, the one move that's also been rumored out there by a lot of people, the Yankees want to cut some salary and maybe add, add some room to make moves either now or in July would be trading Adam out of Vino. Is that a move you think the Yankees should make? Because we're seeing some good relievers come off the board. We talked about Hendricks last week. Kirby Yates is now a member of the Blue Jays as he bounces back from injury. As the bullpen market kind of starts to take shape here a little bit, is out of Vino a trade that you think the Yankees should make? I don't think so. I'd like to see us keeping uh, Adam Adovino. I don't want to get rid of him. I think he's a great setup guy, especially um, leading into that closing position. uh, uh, Yeah, no, you don't get rid of him. Yeah, Robert, I'll throw this to you, too. That would be a move that would surprise me. I know that Adovino had a down 2020, and he's been, I think, a disappointment given what the contract he signed. He signed for Britain money, and Britain's been that much better. But I feel like in this market, unless – unless you're maybe getting Trevor Rosenthal, you would argue you throw Adam out of, you know, in this, in this spot with all the relievers that are out there and he's getting a pretty favorable deal from any team. I don't think you just cut you trade him and add a prospect just for a team to take on that money. I think you got to see what he has, right? I, you would think so. But the, the thing with the out of Vino thing is weird because the, his first year he was great. Um, he, he, he came in, I think he had like a sub two ERA. Uh, and then last year, ran into a lot of issues. And I think a lot of that comes from the new three batter minimum rule. I mean, Adovino cannot seem to get any left-handed batters out uh, regardless of what he throws. The slider doesn't work against lefties. He doesn't have a change up that can kind of dart away and, and get some swings and misses. So when you have this rule where you cannot bring in uh, a reliever, let alone, you know, in the tens of millions of dollars that you're paying for, you know, for more than, for, for less than three batters, you run into a lot of issues if you can't get left-handed hitters out. Um, and I think that's been, you know, the biggest issue for, for Ottavino is he's so, he's got such a big contract. And, you know, there's this new rule that 
makes it impossible for him to basically be used the way the Yankees kind of envisioned him being used and executed, you know, perfectly with. Um, and now you're looking at uh, kind of a lot of money and, and not such a great uh, relieving, reliever situation when it comes to him. Um, so I would, I, I, I would like to see him or at least like to see the Yankees try to test the waters with what they could get with him. Um, because I do think they're a little disappointed in the way that he's performed lately. And, and I do think that they're, you know, they would like to offload that contract in some way or turn it into, you know, more production. So the big name that was thrown out there with the Yankees this week, uh, if you be- you can't really go off. That's why I, if you're going to follow rumors on Twitter, just get notifi- mobile notifications for Jeff Passan and Ken Rosenthal. Yes, I know they got Michael Brantley wrong, but they get everything else right. Like these fake Twitter rumors, kind of why I don't like the off season because everybody can make up a rumor whenever they want, and it's it's all crazy. And it was Luis Castillo, and I don't know about you, Alexis, but to me, I don't see Luis Castillo happening. The, the reports are from John Heyman, the Reds wanted Glaber Torres, which every team wants Glaber Torres. It's no surprise, but he's an ace, and and to me, the Yankees, as good of a players that they have in their farm system, a lot of those top guys they're relying on, I think this year for the most part, and. I don't think the Reds can trade Castillo, to be honest, because they trade him. It signals to their fans, we're not really trying this year. And if fans are allowed in the ballpark, you are probably better off aren't coming. So that to me, that I don't see a trade happening. And if it did, I don't really see the Yankees as an ideal fit for the Reds. Yeah, I definitely, I, that whole Luis Castillo thing is, is sketchy right now. It's kind of hearsay of are we getting him or are we not? You know, I think the Reds have been pretty clear in saying they are not getting rid of him. Um, I think the Yankees have been clear in the past and saying they're not getting rid of Glaber. And I just don't see the Yankees getting rid of Glaber. I, I don't know that that, that I don't think that's a trade you make. Um, do you maybe get rid of some prospects for him? Sure, but it, not a Glaber. See, I, I think, Robert, when you look at the whole Castillo thing and people are complaining, oh, why is everybody asked for Glaber Torres in every deal you make? And I, and I, and I do think. I've said this on the show in the past. I think the Yankees do have, I don't know if it's a Yankee tax. I've been trying to find a better word for it. But there's a reason I think that maybe teams ask a little bit more from the Yankees than everybody else. And I think the reason that is, is because it's easier to explain, and I'll use Joe Musgrove for an example. It's easier to trade Joe Musgrove to the Padres. It's a lot tougher to explain to your fan base, hey, we just traded one of our best players to the Yankees you don't have to watch him play for the Yankees and people whether they love watching Yankees or hate watching the Yankees that could determine how they go through that deal it's a little bit easier from the PR standpoint to trade him to San Diego or remember the whole Garrett Cole thing to trade him from Pittsburgh to Houston so while I don't think that's the end-all be-all Robert I, I think that the Yankees are, go- are going to find themselves in that position and Brian Cashman's not going to overpay just because teams really don't want to send their best players to the Yankees. Yeah, I I agree with that 100%. I don't think many front offices are in the business of trying, you know, to make the Yankees better. Um, And I think when the Yankees are looking to make a trade, you know, as we've seen with the Voight trade and, you know, the Tommy Canley trade that brought him over in 2017 and the Hicks trade with the Twins, the Yankees have made good, shrewd trades in the past, albeit Luis Castillo wouldn't be such a shrewd trade at, at all, really. Um, and, and you brought up the Cole trade, that the Pirates wanted Glaber, and it was only going to be Glaber. And I think the Yankees countered with Clint, and, and the Pirates said no. So, yeah, I, I just don't think other teams want to make the Yankees good. I don't think other teams are in the business of making the Yankees better. Um, and, and I think that is something that, that hurts them a little bit. Yeah, I would I would definitely agree with that. So looking at Joe Musgrove, this is a guy that is probably the best one in five pitcher in baseball. Last year he went one in five with a three point eight sixty ERA and eight starts with the Pirates, fifty five strikeouts, sixteen walks, and thirty nine two thirds innings. Uh, his full season twenty nineteen was eleven and twelve, an ERA about mid four, not terrible numbers. The Padres end up trading five prospects for him. They also trade Joey Lucchesi to the Mets. But the Padres, their best prospect they gave up was Hudson Head. They didn't really give up another elite prospect. Uh, so they now add Musgrove to that rotation. Was Musgrove a player, Robert, you thought the Yankees should have been in on? Um, Probably not if you relate it to uh, the price tag that, that maybe um, was being assigned to him. 
Um, and, and also, I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, I think the Yankees are better off, especially now since they've gotten Kluber, are better off adding another relief arm. I don't think they need to necessarily add another mid, mid-level mid starter um, just because, you know, they'll already have, you know, at some point in the season, they'll have Cole, Severino, Kluber, Domingo, Monty. I mean, that right there is a very good five. Um, and then you have, you know, then you have the the other guys in the back end, like like uh, like Michael King and Schmidt and, and Nick Nelson and all these guys. So I don't think a relief arm is really something that they need to to go after. I think their bullpen is actually kind of thin right now. I mean, it's Chad, uh, Chappie, and Britton, and then beyond that, you know, it's like Luizaga and Adovino, and it gets a little cloudy. So yeah, I mean, I have no problem with the Yankees not being in on Musgrove or not having you know landed Musgrove. I think the team needs, as of right now, kind of lie elsewhere, and I think they lie uh, in the bullpen. So I want to remind everybody out there, it's a new era here at Pinstripe Prospects. We provide exclusive minor league content to paid subscribers through our dugout membership program. You get scouting reports, player interviews, features, and much more in addition to our free major league coverage. Uh, one of those articles includes an interview I did with uh, Casey Dykes, who is a manager in the Yankees organization. He was supposed to be the manager at low A, uh, not a manager, excuse me, the hitting coach at, uh, was supposed to be the hitting coach at low A Charleston. Then the pandemic hit, obviously things changed, but Casey and I got to talk a little bit about uh, his hitting coach philosophy, uh, looking at video. He's also a coach when he was in college, Matt Pita and Elijah Dunham, two players in the Yankees organization. So we got a chance to talk about that a little bit. So that's something you get for free with our dugout membership pro- or our dugout membership program. It's not free, but you for $5.50 a month or $40 a year, you can check out all those articles. But if you use our promo code, Chasin28Pod, again, C-H-A-S-I-N-28Pod, you get the first seven days free. So if you're not sure about us, give us a shot uh, for about a week, and I think you'll enjoy it. Again, it's C H A S I N. Chasen 28 pod is the promo code you use uh, to sign up for our dugout membership program today. So we hope you do. We would appreciate it. Let's go to the Meyer league portion of the show. And Alexis, you wrote another article you wrote for, for us this week uh, was the announcement of baseball America's top 100 prospects list. Now this is the time of the year where uh, we're going to see a lot of top prospect lists. Uh, hopefully we'll have our new one. I would say in like a month or so, we'll keep an eye out for that. Uh, for the top prospects in the Yankee system, but uh, Baseball America did their list. Three Yankees in the top 100, Jason Dominguez, Davey Garcia make an interesting rise, and Clark Schmidt's on the list as well. Tell us a little bit about that, and uh, what stood out to me was, I think, the rise Garcia got. Uh, mostly, I think, from his great Major League season this past year, but uh, starting to get a lot more recognition in uh, Major League prospect circles. Yeah, Davey Garcia coming out at the uh, number 55 uh, spot on that list. And, you know, I I think he deserves it. Um, He's had, like you said, he had a great 2020 rise uh, into the major leagues, making his MLB debut this past season. Um, He's pitched well at the minor league level. um, And I think deserves the honor he's got. You know, spent the majority of the 2020 season at our alternate site, made his MLB debut August 30th, um, and just really impressed. Even getting uh, the start in the ALDS, you know, he was a one-inning opener, but got to start in the ALDS. Not many people can say that. Um, so I think a good honor for him. Yeah, Robert, I think looking at this list, obviously Dominguez is going to be high. And I think if you're talking about one player that every Yankee fan is looking forward to seeing play in minor league baseball at some point next this coming season is Dominguez. Who knows where he'll be? If he'll even be at one of the four big affiliates, we'll find out. But Clark Schmitz here is interesting on this list, being in the in about the the uh, high 60s on this list. And to me, I'm still looking forward to seeing what role he's going to have this year because right now this Yankee rotation, they have a lot of guys looking to prove themselves. And Schmidt had a small chance last year, but I I, I don't think he had that uh, big opportunity that Garcia had. And maybe we'll see as we get to spring training and whenever spring training is that. Clark Schmidt gets a chance to compete, but him being in the high 60s, I think also is a good thing for the Yankees that uh, still, I think that the talent that he has is what still stands out to a lot of people. Yeah, I think, I think with Schmidt, he'll, he'll definitely have an an opportunity this year to make a difference because, you know, you'll have, you'll have Severino out to begin the year. Um, You're likely to run into some sort of injury problems in, in the beginning of the year, you know, whether it be Kluber possibly, you know, re-aggravating his shoulder. Um, maybe Domingo isn't really ready to, to start pitching uh, every fi- every fifth day and he and he goes down. 
So she could re- Clark could really get uh, an, an opportunity this year. And I mean, you go back to 2019 um, when he got called up to Double A. Uh, you know, albeit in 19 innings, still had you know two three seven ERA, nine strikeouts per nine innings. Um, just just put up really solid numbers. And then, like you mentioned, had that very short you know stint in the majors last last year where he he only pitched six and a third and had a seven ERA, which I don't think is indicative or, or meaningful in, in in any sense really. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think Clark Schmidt's a guy that we've heard a lot about um, the last three years. Um, and I think this is the season kind of where we're not going to have Tanaka back. Probably the Yankees aren't going to have Paxton back. Jay Happ's on the Twins. Um, he'll he'll get an opportunity this year, much like Davey got last year. Uh, and, and hopefully he's able to, you know, kind of replicate what, what Davey did in, in making himself known. So last week we began kind of the renewal of our Yankees position minor league overview where we take a look at the as many positions in the in the Yankee system as possible. Last week we looked at shortstops, a very intriguing list. We're going to keep it in the infield this week and take a look at first base, a position currently occupied by Luke Voigt. Obviously right now he is the first baseman of the Yankees near future, but we're look at some first basemen both in the upper tier of the system and in the lower tier of the system and First base isn't exactly the strongest position in the Yankee system, but there are some good names. And Alexis, I'll start with you on this with a Chris Gittens, a player that uh, has seemed to excel at the upper levels of the system and hoping that he gets his opportunity. We all know about Mike Ford and what he did in 2019 at a down year in 2020, but a lot of people are starting to like the upside that Chris Gittens can bring. Yeah, this is a guy that I really like. Um, you got to spend some time watching him when I worked in Tampa with the Tarpons and uh, he happened to be on the team the year I was there. Uh, you know, struggled in 2017, 2018 due to injury. Uh, but, you know, came out really strong in 2019 uh, with Double A Trent and uh, going 112 for uh, 398. But uh, more importantly, had a 281 average, 393 on base percentage, was slugging 500, knocking out uh, 70 or 23 home runs and knocking in 77 RBIs in Trenton in 2019, Uh, but a guy who can put the ball in play and actually ended up being named the Trenton Thunder Player of the Year in 2019 Eastern League MVP as well. Um, Also, the team won the Eastern League Championship in that year. A really good year for Chris Gittens, and I think a breakout year for him. I think it'll be exciting to see what he does here in 2021. You go further down the list past Gittens, Robert. Mickey Gasper, 27th round pick in 2018. This guy that was a catcher, Played some first base and a player that ended his 2019 on a, on a really good note with the high A Tampa Tarpons. Uh, give us some insight on Gasper. Yeah, you, you brought up uh, his his good finish. So, I mean, I, I'd be lying if I said I knew everything about Mickey Gasper. Um, what I do know, you know, in a high A last year, he had 89 plate appearances. And what, what really stood out to me uh, was the, the 395 WOBA and the 156 WRC+. Plus. I mean, those are... Those are, you know, if you compare them to any other level, they're they're gaudy numbers. And, you know, it, it proves the guy can hit uh, slash 321, 393, 462. I mean, on on the stat sheet, at least, you know, it, it would appear that he hits the ball hard. You know, he's got a 377 batting average on balls in play. Uh, yes, that can mean he's maybe got a little lucky last year. But, you know, it could also mean that he just hits the ball hard. Uh, we don't really have that that type of data for the for the minor league guys, but you know I can through dedu- deductive reasoning can you know spin it in, into into that way. So, I mean, yeah, had, had a great year in high A. You know, struck out eighteen percent of the time. Uh, walked the walks were a little down at eight percent, um, but you know, with his eighty nine plate appearances in, in high A and his chance to play at a higher level, he he really performed. Uh, so, you know, maybe he's a, he's a name at 25 years old. He's not, he's not the youngest guy, um, but, you know, maybe, maybe he's a name that, that you hear more about if, you know, things, things go south elsewhere in the Yankees organization at first base. Yeah. Gasper's assignment to start next season is going to be interesting. Will they keep him at what would be now high A Hudson Valley, or does he get to play at some point in double A Somerset early in the season? That'll be something to monitor with the way he ended uh, two years ago. In terms, in terms of the other two names to keep in mind, uh, more recent draft picks, Spencer Henson was a ninth-round pick in 2019 out of Oral Roberts. I got to watch him a little bit in the 14 games he played at short season Staten Island when he hit two home runs, eight RBI. He had 17 runs batted in the 24 games he played in in 2019, and 
when you see him, it's easy, and I think he even knows it. He he, re- he reminds you of Luke Voigt, and he's got a lot of power. I mean, the power is off the charts. He does strike out a lot, 23 strikeouts, but he did have 15 walks as well. Uh, so there is some plate discipline there. So he's not a guy that's going to, like, strike out 50 times and only walk 10. Uh, at least as right now, I, I don't see that. I think he's a player that you, when you go, if you end up going to the ballpark this year and you want to see him play, uh, I think you'll be entertained by the power. So keep an eye on Henson for that raw ability. And the other guy would be Kyle McDonald. Uh, Kyle McDonald's a 27th round pick in 2019 of Arkansas State. Uh, 15 games he played in, but and it is a small sample size in the Gulf Coast League. And again, stats are not the end-all be-all when we talk about minor league baseball. Those who've listened to the program know that. And he is going to be heading into his age 25 season. Did have two home runs, 11 RBI, and more walks and strikeouts. So, yes, a very small sample size, but that's always a good sign. And we're interested to see where he ends up. Uh, Does he stay in the Gulf Coast League? Does he start at low-A Tampa and gets to play at one of those four affiliates? And I think as we get closer to the season, we find out where these Yankees get assigned, and eventually we find out the coaching assignments as well. It'll be really interesting to see um, what happens with the Yankees. So first base, again, not a great position in the system. There are some very intriguing names, especially at the lower marks. I think Gasper, Henson, McDonald are three guys. Uh, that you want to consider because we all the focus is on Mike Ford um, and Chris Gittins, rightfully so. Uh, I want to throw an extra name out there uh, to both of you from the major league level. A name we we tend to ignore because he, let's be honest, he didn't have a great season last year. Um, Alexis, I'll throw it to you first. And Robert, you can follow. Any expectation for Mike Ford? Uh, I mean, I, I'm looking for him to have a good year this year. Um I think it's definitely possible, you know, he came up clutch last year, you know, no, he did not have the greatest year in the world, um, but he had some really clutch at bats, you know, to be proud of that led the Yankees to some wins and some big wins that they needed, um, came off the bench. Well, I, I think your expectation for him would be just to be more successful at the plate. Hopefully he's been working this off season and can come out and prove himself. Uh, I think that's what he needs to do this year. Yeah, I think with Ford, he's somewhere in between the player he was in 2019 and the player he was in 2020. I, I don't know if he's as good as the as the player he was in 2019, and and I'm at least close to positive that he can't be as bad as the player that he was in 2020. So my expectation is for him to kind of you know find his footing um, in in whatever amount of opportunity that he gets this season. I think he's still a really solid hitter bit of a liability in the field. Um, But, you know, with first baseman, you can kind of live with that. So, yeah, in terms of expectations, I I expect him to to perform at least, you know, better than he did last season and kind of prove why people were high on him going into last season. What's interesting to me with Ford, and I think this is also where the LeMahieu re-signing fits into here, LeMahieu's going to get some games at first base. The Yankees do like playing him there. He's not going to be the, obviously not the full-time first baseman that's Voight, but now you have Ford competing for the backup spot, and I think you also have Miguel Andujar, who can maybe get some reps at first base. Who knows what they tried to do with him this spring as he tries to make that new impression on the Yankees again. So it's not exactly a slam dunk that Mike Ford would be back on the Major League bench, so he's going to have a, a big opportunity to reprove himself this spring when spring training eventually gets underway. But I want to touch on it. We'll get into a, a little bit more of a serious note here. Um, he didn't get a chance to read the story uh, by Mina Kimes and Jeff Passan last couple of days. Please go check it out. Uh, obviously, it revolves who is the currently former Mets general manager, Jared Porter, uh, sending 62 text messages and an unsolicited lewd photo to a female reporter. Uh, he's out of a job. Steve Cohen and the Mets did the absolute right thing. Uh, fired him immediately that morning after the news broke uh, on Monday night. And, and I wanted to take some time to touch on the story because, uh, Alexis, obviously you're doing a great job for us. And uh, as a woman in this profession that wants to be in this profession, I, I want to get your thoughts because I feel like we, we should want to ha- have all the talent in this industry possible. And, and I feel like there are some people out there that kind of ruin that and make it – where this kind of behavior, it's, it, it happens way too much and it's got to stop. But uh, I want to have let you have the floor and uh, talk about it, this uh, very serious issue uh, that's been brought up over the last 48 hours or so. Yeah, I would definitely say, you know, this is 
gosh, this is something that definitely needs to stop happening. And we do see it happen too often. And this is already an industry for females that is incredibly difficult to get into. Um, Major League Baseball and professional sports in general are very, very male-dominated industries. Um, And especially in the communication field and in the realm of reporting, so much harder to get it as a female um, because you have interaction with male athletes and there's the whole issue of being in the locker room and this and that. So it's, it's already so hard to get into. And now you have females who are in it, who are turned away from it because of situations like this, or who say they're embarrassed to say they're a woman in sports because of this Uh, just absolutely inexcusable. And, and, you know, just, this is a whole new level, but, you know, you had the issue, I hate to break it, but Nick Saban um, completely berating a female reporter on air uh, during a college game once. Uh, just these females are just getting absolutely beat down and bogged. And, you know, my heart goes out to that reporter um, who had to deal with that issue. Um, just absolutely unacceptable. And I definitely praise the Mets for for getting rid of him. That was the right thing they had to do that. There was no option, no way around it. You know, you had people out there saying, uh, did you hear both sides of the stories? Did you get both sides? Are you just firing him because of what the media said? That's There's no spot for that at all um, in, in the professional sports industry. It absolutely makes me sick to even think about. Robert, did you want to touch on it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the biggest issue when it comes to, you know, especially female reporters is that they especially um, – are put under a microscope unlike any any male reporter there is you know it's if if you're rude or come off as rude as a female reporter you know the men in the industry and especially the men playing the sports and you know the athletes themselves will will kind of cut you out and discredit you whereas on the flip side if you're um, I don't know if you're kind or you come off as nice for some reason uh, you know some athletes or even people like Jared Porter go down that inappropriate path that that should not be taken and should not be taken in that way. Um, so we you can't really have a situation where, you know, you put uh, female reporters in sports, especially under a microscope that you're not also putting male reporters under. Um, there, there's not enough equality in that sense. And I think when it comes to the pressure that you're putting on female reporters to act a certain way, the pressure you're putting on female reporters to deal with situations like this Jared Porter uh, situation um, is something that needs to change, and I think it comes uh, really down to how we how we label, you know, on a, in a broader sense, um, like you know, women in our society. You know, we we put them under a microscope based on uh, things they say or how they act, when in reality, you know, it, it's much deeper than that. And I think that's kind of a situation we saw here with Jared Porter, where you know maybe he thought a reporter, um, you know, was ponying up to him or something, and he thought he could take advantage of that. Um, So that general culture um, in and of itself is something that needs to be uh, reconfigured from the outside in, um, no doubt. And I think to end the conversation on this, it it also is a good thing to see a lot of men in the industry saying, look, we can't have this happen. We have to be sure if we're seeing this, we got to stop it. Uh, That's primary issue number one. I mean, this has zero reason to be happening in any sport. It's already you have that power struggle with sometimes with interviews where uh, the coach or whatever you interview with knows they've got uh have that power to in the interview and now you're making it even worse in the process so uh, to me that has to change period and we have to do a better job of preventing that from happening i think also to touch on i think sandy alderson did a good job outside of i think accidentally saying where the reporter was from it's a good thing that the media out there hasn't tried to figure it out who it is and I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, just a, a very serious situation. Again, if you haven't read the article uh, by Mina Kimes and Jeff Passan, please take some time. Check it out. Uh, really good story done by both great reporters uh, in the baseball industry. Last topic before we get to final thoughts. I, I think we had to make this a separate topic. George Springer to the Blue Jays, six years, $150 million. Uh, as I mentioned, we mentioned earlier, Robert, the Blue Jays finally got somebody to take their money. They didn't get everybody to take their money, as we found out with Michael Brantley. But what do you think George Springer to Toronto means? And is this a signing Yankee fans need to worry about? 
Yeah, it's funny. It's funny you say that because it really felt like with every single free agent name that popped up, I was getting a notification on Twitter, you know, saying the Blue Jays were interested or the Blue Jays made an offer, um, right. and and it fi- it finally uh, it finally fell through at least you know on, on Springer for them. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's uh, at least as close as possible uh, to fair to or as fair as fair you can be to say that maybe the Blue Jays have kind of leapfrogged uh, the the Rays in terms of. Um, you know, providing a challenge to the Yankees. You know, the the Rays losing Snell is, you know, a big help to the Yankees. Um, I mean, and the Blue Jays now have a pretty dangerous lineup, right? They got they got Springer, uh, Vlad Guerrero, um, Bo Bichette. Uh, I mean, uh, they're, they're, they, they have the chance to be, to be loaded. Um, and I think, oh, yeah, Kevin Biggio, can't forget about him. So, yeah, they have the chance to be a really solid team. Um, and, and I don't think they're done shelling out, you know, the money as we saw. They probably were ready to do the Brantley deal, so they have the ability to, you know, to not only you know get a guy like Springer and 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 be competitive, but to to add to that. And I think you know this year we're going to be talking about the Blue Jays um, a, a lot more than usual, and you know I might venture to say more than the Rays when it comes to competition. Alexis, what'd you make of the uh, Springer signing by Toronto? Uh, great signing for Toronto. I think they are going to be an organization to be reckoned with this year. Um, got to give it to them. They have had a phenomenal off season. Um, and Springer was a great signing for them. Absolutely great one. Um, Springer got long term. He got a lot of money out of it. Uh, it's going to be a real contribution to that lineup for sure. Yeah, I think you look at the George Springer signing, and I think the one thing it brings to the Blue Jays is experience. Uh, yeah. He's a guy that comes with a, a proven track record, both hitting in the leadoff spot and hitting in the postseason. You can take, you can look at the Astros' 2017 title, however you want to look at it. But at the same time, this guy was one of the better hitters on that team and helped them win a championship. So at the very least, Toronto brings in a winning player to help that young clubhouse. They bring in a guy that is a very good defensive center fielder. Story so just. Get anywhere else. You need for defense. So I, I think at the same time, I think you look at the Blue Jays. I'm not counting out the Rays either yet. I, I always say count the Rays at your own peril because they just seem to make crazy things happen. Where they like Some guy will come up and make an impact. But I think it, this proves the American League East is – we don't know the playoff format, which is weird that it's against it's January 20th. And we don't know the playoff format. Or we don't know the DH. But at the same time – if there is this, let's say a similar format to last year, I think you look around the American League and how weak it is. The A at least could have three playoff teams. Yeah, it's not out of their own possibility. Yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of a lot of good teams. The Rays always find a way to be good, um, and and the Blue Jays are uh, approaching scary territory. So it, it might be um, a stressful division to to say the least. So as we wrap up the show, we do what we do every week. That's Final Thoughts. And Final Thoughts was was fun last week. We had a weird trivia question that one of our panel knew the answer already. And we realized the question was not asked well. So there is no trivia question on the show this week. Uh, But it's a chance we could talk about, well, whatever we want to talk about. Uh, So Alexis, why don't you start us off? What's your uh, final thought for this week? Oh, gosh, my final thought. You know, I had to go with last week. Uh, the Jags were in, in talks with Urban Meyer, and now they got their guy. Uh, Urban Meyer will be joining the Jaguars. Um, I'm excited for it. I'm excited for a new era in Jacks. Um, good good signing for our organization there. And now just the hope of uh, April comes. Hopefully we can go get our guy t- uh, Trevor Lawrence and Urban Meyer talking about maybe wanting to go get Kyle Pitts, too. I would not be upset if we can somehow score that great first round. Yeah, there's, a couple, there's a couple of sides to Alexis that would really like that deal from both the pro and college uh, level for that. Uh, yeah. So definitely going to be some fun times out there in Jacksonville. Robert, what about you? What's your final thought for this week? I'll build off. I'll build off that thought. Um, big Jets fan myself, and you know, it's someone familiar with bad teams hiring new coaches. Robert Saleh, I think, will uh, will ride the boat to the for, for the Jets or drive the boat, I should say, and uh, turn that organization around. Um, much like Urban Meyer, but you know, I think Saleh Saleh is the guy to to kind of change that that culture over there. 
Lots of football on the show this week. I, I'm really interested by that. Um, I'll get. How about this? I'll give you one baseball and I'll give you one football. I'll I'll add to the football team here. Uh, for the baseball side, like I mentioned, we don't know the DH. We don't know the playoff format, which again I find odd. Uh, but we talked a little bit. I think it was last week about the man on second and the seven inning doubleheaders. I I like the seven inning doubleheaders. To me, I think it's a good way to prevent so much of the fatigue on a roster. It wears out. A, if you have a doubleheader, it can tend to wear out a pitching staff. I think seven inning doubleheaders, I don't know if they're the way to go, but if there's one rule I'd like to see kept, it's probably that. Because I think you have a better shot of seeing two good games that way than if you play two non inning doubleheaders. Because in, if you do end up going to ball, going to games again, and there'll be limited fans, maybe at some point when we figure out this whole thing with the vaccine, but you might have one game where it's you will have split entry, and one game you'll get the really good players, and the other game you'll get the, the most of the bench playing. And I think if you want to at least have okay, maybe you get a chance where both it, a guy plays both games because it's seven innings. I actually like that idea. I still hate the run run second thing. I know people. I get why people like it so much. I, I understand that people want games to end, but I don't want the rules to change once we get to extra innings. No other sport does that. I mean, football, they just shrink the time limit. Basketball, they play five and a quarter. I mean, hockey is maybe the closest because they do three on three, but it's only five minutes anyway. Baseball, I, I, why do we have to now put a guy on second? And it doesn't really change anything. It makes people just want to hit home runs even more. There's not the, the whole thing about, oh, we're going to see the strategy. We didn't exactly see a lot of bunts and small ball and things happen anyway. So why are we going down this road anyway? I, I, personally, I don't like it. That's besides the point. I'll chime in on this one too, Ricky. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Your whole point on that. Uh, you know, I agree with the seventh inning or seven inning double headers. I think too, you you save pitchers. I think these nine inning double headers, these pitchers are just absolutely the bullpens are absolutely exhausted, and they're having to go down to AAA, double A to go grab guys to to fill those holes as their twenty seventh man or however many players they bring up for those games, and it has to be extra pitchers. Um, but you know, I, I definitely agree that that wouldn't be one thing that I'd be mad at. I think save your pitching and keep the guys healthier longer. Um, but then also you look at the whole runner on second. I hate it. I don't like that rule at all. I'm with you on that. Um, I didn't like it at the minor league level. I still don't like it. It's just you didn't earn that runner. So why why are we starting with that? Or for the pitcher, you didn't earn that runner to be on there. Um, or if that run goes in, well, now it's an unearned run for you that you didn't deserve to have put on you. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to see that one come back at all. I'm with you. But at least at the minor league level, it makes sense only because if you're a minor league team, especially at a lower level, you might only have five pitchers that you have set to pitch that day and that yeah. you can't pitch anyone else. There's at, a difference at, using well, it there. At the minor league level, their whole point was to speed up games. Having worked in it, I don't think it sped up games at all doing that. Mm -hmm. That's just my opinion on it. All right, so let me, give, let me give you the football point. And <laughs> you guys are fans of teams that, of course, had the top two picks in the draft. I'm a fan of a team that actually has a top 15 pick for the first time in 20 years. And I know everybody has asked me, what are my thoughts on Tom Brady back in a conference championship game for the 14th time? Uh, as I watch my team miss the playoffs and Tom Brady, who left my team, right, I, think, I think rightfully so, to go play for another team. I did not root for Tom Brady in the wild card game because I didn't. I wanted Brady and Belichick to kind of finish with the same amount of playoff wins this year, zero. But as the season, as the playoffs have gone on, gone on I was rooting for Tampa Bay last week, and I'm going to keep rooting for Tampa Bay to beat Green Bay. And I think the dream thing, if you're a Tom Brady fan out there, is that the Buccaneers play the Chiefs in the Super Bowl, and Tom Brady once again beats Patrick Mahomes, and everybody who they've already crowned almost the greatest of all time, Mahomes, gets beaten by a man who would then win his seventh Super Bowl and would probably never be talked about in a, in a different uh, in a different aura compared to Brady and Mahomes. We would not have that conversation anymore. So I, I think to me, I, it's easy for me to root for Brady. I know that some Patriot fans don't really like rooting for Gronkowski because of uh, retiring and then coming back. The Antonio Brown factor leans into it, at least for me, in a lot of the cases with Tampa Bay. But I've kind of learned to like let that go aside. And you just got to appreciate what Tom Brady's doing. I, I know he hasn't had the greatest numbers, but at age 43, 
uh, they get back to an AF- to an NFC Championship game. I think they're beating the Packers this week. Uh, to me, I think you look at the way they're top. What the one quarterback that knows how to play in cold weather is Tom Brady, and it's a different pressure for Aaron Rodgers to actually have a home NFC Championship game. Not saying he's going to struggle, uh, but I do think Tampa Bay wins. Tom Brady gets back again, and we just keep talking about how great Tom Brady is because I know the media loves to talk about how great he is. They, it's one of their favorite topics, but and also the Brady Belichick thing. There's no, there's no who was right more. Both, both played a big role in why the Patriots won so much. It, it doesn't matter who takes more credit for it. To me, they both needed each other, and I think they both still need each other. Maybe Brady's needed more New England, but that's a different argument. But to me, it, just because Belichick's had a bad year doesn't take away from uh, the 20 good years they've had. So I wanted to chime on that because I know a lot of people have asked me about that, both on my show uh, and over on social media. So. Uh, that's our show for this week. Uh, again, uh, hopefully we'll hear from uh, James O'Connell next week. By the way, shout out to James. Uh, check out the Tiger documentary on HBO, too. Uh, so I'll throw those my shout out to James this week. want to remind you can follow us on Twitter at Pinstripe Pros. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes uh, or wherever else get your podcast. Just search Pinstripe Prospects Podcast. That's where it's there. Uh, please give us a rating. We hope it's five stars. We want to hear from you. Tell us what you like, what you don't like. Email me, rickjkeeler at gmail.com. Please be sure to sign up for our Dugout membership program. Again, it's $5.50 a month, $40 a year. And use the promo code CHASING28POD. Get your first seven days free. We would greatly appreciate you taking the time to subscribe to our website today. Uh, so, Alexis, how can they follow you on Twitter? You can follow me at Alexis Farinacci. And Robert, how can they follow you on Twitch? By the way, I forgot to mention you wrote our story on a DJ LeMayhew signing, so be sure to check that out. But Robert, how can they follow you on Twitter? Yeah, you can follow me at uh, R Coles, R C O L E S zero two zero six. And you can follow me on Twitter at Rickinator five five five. It's at R I C K letter I Nader like Terminator three five. Check out my show this week on Full Press Radio. Uh, Kicking with Keeler, we got a great show coming this week. We'll preview the conference championship games. Uh, we'll look at a little bit with the big three with the Nets. We'll do a little college basketball with the March Madness news. And of course, we'll uh, talk more about some of the big signings and the Jared Porter news. We'll talk about more on the show as well. Uh, so from all of us here at Pinstripe Prospects, for Rob Pimpsner and everybody on the team, I'm Ricky Keeler saying have a great rest of your week. Stay safe. Please wear a mask. And we'll see you back here next week to talk more Yankees baseball. Have a great night, everyone. Have a good night.